Doubt is It's a long haul. <laughs> Jonas? I, don't know, I didn't give you a new copy of the syllabus. Today we're going to work out without the projector because it's, it's, it's broken. Oh. So, which is actually probably a good thing. <laughs> well, what about those online people? They can no, they're still going to get the TV. Oh, they still, still going to get it. They're just not, we're just not going to have any PDF files of any notes, but I have a feeling those are not all that valuable anyway. I printed out the handwritten ones. You mean the typed mean ones? The typed yeah, typed ones. What I think I'm going to do, because it takes so long to type those out, I'm going to, and since it's a small class, I'm going to write out notes. The book, they'll be longhand, and I'll just hand them out to class. Yeah, that's fine. That way you don't have to use your own paper. It's just a small class. Now, it's going to hurt that yeah. one person, online person, they're going to have to have some other way to get them. Yeah. Because um, I'm not going to scan them, I yeah. think. It's too much work oh, for well, just I the know five people. If you give me an extra copy, I see them on um, Mondays and Wednesdays. I can. Yeah, so I think it would be hard for the weekend. Maybe there's some pickup spot. He said he's here on Fridays, though, too. Yeah, I'll find some place to 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 drop it. Yeah, I'll just leave one on the door. Good idea. (coughs) So, uh, okay. Um, Okay. Here's your homework, and um, we'll get started. Um, I reminded you all that we are going to change homework three to uh, a little bit. So on the original syllabus, it's changed on the website. Um, and I'll be getting homework four up there pretty soon. I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, about assignment ahead of you in terms of where I'm thinking. So sometimes I may l- seem a little rusty in actually what I'm talking about now because I'm already thinking about Hilbert spaces. But... Uh, <laughs> Um, I'll try to uh, get in sync here. Last time we didn't quite finish the compactness discussion. I may not finish everything that's in the book. The book is very complete, and I just don't have time for every last sentence in there. But I'm going to try to cover the main thing that's in the chapters. 
Um, and, and the whole point of these lectures is to give you some examples besides what's in the chapter because it's very complete. Um, so I did want to give you at least one example, I think, that probably is in the book anyway, for that compactness discussion we were having last time. The, the short and sweet of it is if it's finite dimensional, compact, finite dimensional uh, metric space, compact if and only if closed and bounded. Actually, no, that was a finite dimensional norm space, sorry. So if it's a finite dimensional norm space, then a subset is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded. That's the short and sweet of it. If it's not finite dimensional norm space. Did you delete one problem off of there? Yes, Did number eight. Oh, did I have another one on there? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. So this is a long assignment, homework three. Sorry about that. That's a long assignment. Let's, thank you, Joyce. Correct it. So let's have this one theorem. If x is a finite dimensional, I couldn't talk about finite dimensional metric space because it wouldn't be necessarily defined, but a finite dimensional normed space. Then a subset M in X is compact if and only if M is closed and bounded. I'm going to have to figure out my board work here for the camera. Do you have the whole width of the board, Brett? Okay. I'll have to figure out the board work. Okay, so that's the theorem. Pretty much along the lines we were using already. There's a short proof in the book. So, what's the counterexample? What if we're in infinite dimensions? Yeah, let's take the unit ball. Counterexample. Let uh, B, 0, 1, with a bar over the top, be the closed unit ball in little l infinity. Then the claim is that is not compact. So that would be closed because I closed it. Okay, and bounded because it's the set of all elements of norm less than or equal to one. Okay. It's closed and bounded, but yet it's not compact. Claim uh, this is not compact. And what you do is you simply come up with a sequence that has no convergent subsequence. Indeed, this is almost the simplest thing you can think of. You just take uh, xn equal to um, en, where <laughs> e1 is 1, 0, 0, 0, dot, 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 e2 is 0, 1, 0, 0, dot, 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 and so on. The um, analog of the unit vectors, but now in infinite dimensions, right, et cetera. Then what do you have? You have the following holes. You have the obviously En minus Em, which has a, has a couple ones in it. 0, 0, 0, I guess if uh, 1, if this is the nth place, and then, and so on, 0, 0, 0, and then minus 1 if this is the nth place, 0, 0, 0, and so on, 0. That thing has uh, norm 
one, obviously, in L infinity, the supremum of the absolute values of the entries for all n unequal to m. Okay. Therefore, what? Therefore, no subsequence of Xn, of the sequence Xn, can even be Cauchy, can be, uh, can be Cauchy. No sequence can be Cauchy. So therefore, not convergent. Therefore, no subsequence can be convergent. I think that's the simplest way to say it. Can even be convergent, much less con uh, convergent to a point in the closed unit ball. Okay, so there's no convergent subsequence, period. To any to anything in L infinity. I think that'd be easier to show directly to you and you have to use this Cauchy argument. This, is, this just makes it easier. <clears throat> so you just keep going out in the dimensions, okay? You just keep using a new dimension. In fact, there's a theorem in the book also that, let's see, what number is that that's, um, theorem 22.5-5, that the closed unit ball of the norm space is compact if and only if the dimension is finite. of norm space theorem. Closed unit ball of norm space X is compact if and only if the dimension of the space is finite. So in an infinite dimensional space, the closed unit ball is never compact. We just gave him one example. And that takes a little bit more work uh, with something called Reese's Lemma. Um, which I have not stated here. Uh, lemma 2.5-4. Okay. It's a little bit more complicated to state, so I'm going to skip that now. Um, but basically, it's a kind of a cute construction showing that you can't. have a closed unit ball compact if you're in infinite dimensions. Um, maybe I'll put that on the midterm exam, too. <laughs> Give you something to play with Reese's lemma or something. There's one good problem there in the text. Um, OK. So again, it's a couple lines in this in this in these notes you can have a look at, except for the proof of recent level, which I did not put in the notes either. Other comments about this though? The the fact that so closed and bounded is not a good condition unless you're in finite dimensions. Okay. What you did say is that if it is compact, then it must be closed and bounded. We did that say that much. So this implication is true always, and it's just this reverse one that's not good. Okay. All right, so now I want to kind of change gears and talk about linear operators, something which is a fairly simple subject, actually, to a point, okay? And because um, I want to get you ready for this next homework. <laughs> Are there any comments or questions about this week's homework, which is on 2.4 through 2.6? It just gets you into the definition of linear operator, actually, this week.
it's not very deep, but. Uh, the one and two five, we just have to go the one direction, right? Let's have a look. Five, um, four, because it said, um, so we just have to show if compact, then this holds. We don't. Have, it says it can be shown the condition is also sufficient for the compact. Okay. That is correct. So we don't have to show that direction, right? Right. The one direction. Right. Okay. Let's have a look at the homework number two. Let's we'll see what I have about that. 2.5 number four. This is the hard one, right? <laughs> Show that you have an infinite subset M you have for an infinite subset M in the space S to be compact, it is necessary that for each coordinate, the, the, the set of coordinates, the set of K coordinates is bounded. Okay. So let's have a look at that. That's an interesting problem. 2.5 number four. Question, you have, so S equals sequence space. And what's the norm on there? Okay. I don't think there is a norm. There's a metric. Metric, oh, there's a metric. Yeah, there's a metric that's not defined by the norm. So you have metric, sequence space, um, the distance between two sequences x and y is defined to be the summation um, where, where x, x is equal to c1, c2, and so on, y is equal to a to 1, a to 2, and so on. So we're in a metric space here. dxy is equal to 2 to the minus, let's say k goes from 1 to infinity, 2 to the minus k ck minus a to k over 1 plus ck minus a to k. Yeah, so this is a metric space and not a norm space. Okay. Now we're going to have a... The problem is this. So M is a infinite subset. Of such sequence of sequences, okay. Well, if it's not infinite, then there's nothing to really prove, right? And then um, what you want to do is you show that for each k, to show, assume assume m is compact. Compact subset of metric space S. Okay. For each to show, for each K, the set of the collection of K coordinates, the set of all CK of X, you could call it, as X ranges in M. Okay, so I can call C1 is actually, you could put more tack on here, C1 is C1 of the sequence X, right? C2 is the, is the second coordinate of the sequence X, and so on. CK is the K, is the kth coordinate of the sequence x. So that's adding more tackle so we can describe what I'm talking about. He's talking about the set of kth coordinates. That's just a subset of the real line, right? This is a subset of the real line. We'll just, let's just work with the real line here, if you want here. I don't care. If it's real or complex, it doesn't make a change in the problem. Okay? Say. Alright? I think sequence space was complex numbers, but say, it's not going to make a whole, any difference. OK. 
Okay, so that's a subset of the real line. You're supposed to say, say that uh, to show this is subset uh, satisfies. Uh, uh, in fact, the C K X X in M is a subset of some closed interval minus gamma K to gamma K. All right, for some finite gamma K greater than zero. Greater than zero. Okay. All right, so you're in some bounded closed interval for these kth coordinates. Let's see. Let's see if there's any hints about this. There's no hints in the back of the book. So, okay, it's not saying that for a given sequence x, every one of the sequences is going to be right? But it's saying that if you just pick any x out of this, out of Say it has a some gamma, gamma two or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you, no matter what x you pick out of this subset M, its sec second coordinate is going to be bounded by that gamma k. Is that right? Yeah, a gamma sub two. So yeah, say if you take this, the collection of second coordinates, mm -hmm. right, so it's, it's going to be actually I think it's going to be that. Um, probably the collection of second coordinates has to be a closed and bounded set in the real line, okay? They just showed you that it's supposed to be uh, bounded. I think uh, it must be that the second coordinates have to also be closed. Basically, because what you can do is you can take any, if you just sort of uh, take the first coordinate and throw all the others away, okay? Then, in other words, project onto the first coordinate. So if I just take if I, um, that would be projecting M into some other set, okay? But that's, uh, M being compact uh, implies that every sequence has a subsequence that converges. Well, uh, the first coordinate is going to have to converge, all right? In other words, when I say this, when I say uh, Xn goes to X, then in particular the first coordinates have to converge by this metric. Check that. If, if, if xn goes to some x, okay, then c1 super n goes to c1 in particular, all right? So the coordinates have to converge point-wise. Does that make sense? Coordinate wise because in order for this distance to go to zero, each sum end must go to zero, right? So in particular, uh, in other words, if I if I put if I put d x n x here, by putting some more tackle here, I have my c k. That's my x, and here I have my c super k n here. So notice that first that 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 if this whole sum is going to go to zero, then each sum end must eventually vanish. So in other words, in particular, this numerator here must go to zero, okay? Because this quotient goes to zero if and only if the numerator goes to zero. All right. So I'm saying a over one plus a goes to zero if and only if a goes to zero. All right. That's pretty obvious. When a is pot, if when a is a non-negative number, a is greater than equal to zero. Okay. Even if it was negative, that's <laughs> no way. Okay. So, so there you have that. So each of the coordinates goes to zero. So, um, okay. So what I'm saying, if you take, um, if you have a subsequence that's going to converge, then in particular, um, for each fixed coordinate, all right, the subsequence will have to correspondingly converge. Okay. All right. 
So what you're going to do is if you just look at uh, what I claim is then if you just look at, if you just look at this set then, okay, the claim is that that's a compact set because I just checked it. If I have a subsequence of the, that this, if I have a subsequence of the x's that converges, then the corresponding subsequence of these will converge, okay? So therefore, I've established that this is compact. Done. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's all there is to the problem. So hopefully you understood. Okay. So it's mostly a notational nightmare, but yeah, you have to sort of stare at this metric and so on. Now to go the other way, certainly, I'll give you some extra credit if you can prove the converse. Okay. Yeah. I know. I think, yeah. Oh, was easier? was easier for me to I don't know. I I You can see how he, I'm sure that it was a notational choice for him. They didn't really want to, but. It seemed to make sense. It's just to avoid using bold face. I mean, if in, in nowadays you probably use bold x right. for the vector, and then just use x1, x2, x3, and then how do you do the sequence? Though then it gets a little complicated. Right. So he kept it kind of sparse. He tries to keep the c's out of the picture as much as he can. Uh, Isn't there another letter he could use? Though? I, I think he did a decent job, but it is a bit of a, a pain to get over that. Yeah, a lot of squiggles, a lot of squiggles. But somehow there's no way to get around the fact that you have these infinite sequences. Those are the basic objects you're working with. You have to, the first thing you have to do is you have to go away from Rn. So you don't have X, Y, Z. Yeah. You, you have to go to the infinite sequence. And so he could have used something a little bit more pleasant to work with, but you can't get rid of the sub-index and super-index. You just can't get rid of that. That's so all you're left with is a C after that. Something to hold the lower index and the upper index. <laughs> okay, so you can't get away from the double indexing, unfortunately. I would think that's the worst three point I've ever been to Okay. <laughs> all right, well, let's change it then. You could use, okay. if you'd rather use data in your homework, no problem. Okay. I, I'll live with that. Okay. Just. Whatever, as long as it's consistent. Okay, so let's go on then. Are there any other questions about this homework? That was the one that was a little bit kind of creepy looking. It looked like, wow, he threw it. There aren't that many hard problems in here. Now, occasionally, by the way, a hint is, because I looked at one of the problems, I said, I don't know if I can solve this problem that easy. But if it had bold face, like, uh, like it had a topic after it in a problem, you can look in the index, and there'll be a theorem or a lemma later in the book. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. So if there's a if there's a bold face <laughs> associated with it, you say, I don't know if I can prove this. If you want to cheat, then you can look. <laughs> but you always you can always cheat by uh, thank you. You can always cheat by um, by looking to another book, of course. But this book is very pleasant in some sense because because there's almost nothing that he doesn't help you with. I was surprised with that. I thought, oh, wow, here's a problem. It's just, it's just, it's a nasty problem. Better not assign this problem. Then I looked a little bit more and said, oh, there's the answer over there. Okay, you know, a few sections away. Um, because he had, it was a topic, right? It was a topic that he had to cover. So it was somewhere else in the book. Um, so occasionally he'll throw you a, a curveball, but it's not for real curveball if you know what you're doing. So let's go on. Let's talk about linear operators now. It's not that I don't have to stew about problems too occasionally. <laughs> okay. What's a linear operator? Now he he was very precise about his notation here. So what I'm going to have 
is officially all I have is two vector spaces. And so he's, he has to layer this on first vector space, then norm space, then, you know, some other things. Norm space is normally what we're talking about. And then special cases of norm spaces like Hilbert spaces and so on. So there's all kinds of things to layer. But so first I'm going to have x and y are vector spaces. Something very simple. And the domain of T is going to be a vector subspace of X. So actually, he's got to be very careful because the domain is not going to always be X. It's going to be something else, perhaps smaller than X. Okay, and he'll uh, he'll designate that by writing t from the domain of t to y, where this is just the ordinary function notation. D of t is the domain of a function. Y is the target set. In other words, you you're getting elements that belong to the vector space y, but it's not the range. If he wants to designate the range, R of t equals range. This is the domain. D of t is the domain of t. R of t is the range. Equals the set of all y equals t of x that I can obtain by letting x range over the domain. So the author mentions if he puts x in place of dt, here in this notation, then it means that the domain of T is equal to X. All right. So this is this is this is the notation. It just turns out that uh, you have to consider different domains. All right. Uh, sometimes we'll define an operator, and then you can perhaps extend it to a larger domain. So we have to be a little bit careful in this notation. So it's just a little bit different. Instead of using the uh, x is your domain all the time. You have some super vector space, which may not be the actual domain of the operator. OK, so if he writes, if he writes, uh, so the notation is t x to y means x equals the domain. OK. Um, T um, dt to r of t means r of t is the range. Okay, but if I write this, which is typical, he doesn't mean that y is the range. Y is y. Uh, the range of t is contained in y. All right, it's some subset. Okay. So this is going to be the standard notation. And some of these other ones will be special cases. All right. So that's just the, the function notation. What is linearity? Linearity means that if I take, if x1 and x2 belong to the domain, and alpha is scalar, then Linearity means if x1 and x2 belong to the domain and alpha is scalar, then the t of the x1 plus x2 is the sum of the t's, tx1 plus tx2. Also note that he doesn't use the parenthesis unless he has to. So I use the parentheses here because I am taking a sum, and I need to indicate that I'm applying t to the sum. Here, where there is no ambiguity, I don't use the parentheses. t of alpha x is alpha x1, I guess, is alpha t x1. OK? So the usual linearity properties that you have. Those, these, this sum makes sense because you're 
because your target set is a vector space, so you can you you can add things in Y, in capital Y. You can scale and multiply in capital Y. All right. So that's the definition of a linear operator. This is a notation. It's a function that has this linearity property. Period. Okay. Now automatically, what happens? T of zero, the zero element is in every domain, by the way, because any, do any vector subspace contains a zero element. So zero is in every domain. So, and the simplest linear operator, of course, is the operator that just sends everything to zero. Of course, you can define that on all of X. That's the zero operator. That's trivial. T of zero has to always be equal to zero, though. T of zero equals T of zero times X, because zero times anything is zero. And of course, that's zero times tx, which is zero. So t of zero is always zero. It's trivial. But what else could be sent to zero is called the null space. So we're using the script notation, script d, script r. There's going to be a script n that I'll write like that. Uh, script n of t is a set of all vectors x in the domain such that t of x is equal t, I don't need the parentheses, tx equal to zero. Sometimes I forget and put the parentheses because I'm used to it. <laughs> so the t of x is equal to zero. This was zero times here, which is equal to zero. So that's called the null space. Okay. Now, often we're interested in whether an, a linear operator is invertible or not. Of course, invertible means I'll just be able to take an element in the range and send it back to where its, its element of the domain was. Does that make sense? Well, I have to talk about one-to-one -one functions. After all, C is just a function in the first place. What's a one-to-one -one function? T is one-to-one. We all teach this, right? <laughs> if, now here's, here's, the, here's the condition that's the easiest to state for any function. If tx1 equals tx2 implies that x1 equals to x2. I think that's the easiest one to, easiest definition for one to one. The images are the same implies the domain elements are the same. This is, um, okay, and all right, so now we have a very simple criterion. When is T one to one? Who will venture the uh, theorem or look ahead or just say, what is a condition using this null space? What's the condition that T should be one to one? T is one to one if and only if the zero space, exactly. Okay, so this is uh, theorem. Um, I forgot the theorem number. 2.6-10. A. I'll just do, because I'm doing the simplest thing first. Okay, 2.6-10-A. <laughs> T is one to one if and only if the null space of T is the zero space. Just means the element, the vector space consisting of one vector. Actually, it's not very hard to show that the null space is itself a vector space. Um, maybe we should show that just in the margin over here. How do you show this is a, a, a vector space? Yeah, show additive and, and scalar multiplicative closure. So I add two things in the null space and show that that's again in the null space. Well, that follows here. All right? If x1 and x2 are in the null space, then this is 0, that's 0. Therefore, this is 0. 0 plus 0 equals 0. Okay? So the sum is in the null space. Should I go that, to that again? Just double check it. If x1. x1 and x2 belong to the null space, 
That means they get sent to the zero element in Y. Then TX1 equals TX2 equals zero. So T of X1 plus X2 equals zero. So X1 plus X2 is in the null space. All right, and so you can do the same thing with the scalar multiplication business. Therefore, the null space is closed under addition. It's also closed under scalar multiplication with the same kind of ditty. And therefore, you have that this is a vector subspace, N of T is a vector subspace of the domain. So I don't think I even made that an exercise. It was probably stated somewhere in the book. If I did, then I did it. Okay, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, now, so some of these little things. So T is one to one if this is the definition for what a one to one function is. Any one to one function, that's defined by that, okay? And now I claim that T is one to one if and only if the null space is the zero space. Okay, well that's a pretty easy proof. Proof of 2610. Suppose first that T is one to one to show that the null space is a zero space, okay? Um, if um, x1 is unequal to x2 and t of x1 equals t of x2, uh, well, then that's a contradiction. Uh, and t is not one to one. What am I doing? So, um, but this last condition must hold if the null space is not the zero space because uh, then there exists uh, x1 and x2 with tx1 equals tx unequal to tx1 equal to tx2 equal to zero. Okay, so clearly if T is one to one, then the null space must be the zero space by contradiction. Because if it's not the zero space, then you get two things getting mapped to zero. No good. All right? So what about the other direction? Therefore, uh, N of T equals the zero space. Contradiction. So that's too easy. Now, <laughs> the other way is suppose, on the other hand, conversely, suppose um, N of T is the zero space. Um, check the condition. Check the condition for one to one. Assume Tx1 equals Tx2. I must show that x1 equals x2. All right. Well, Tx1 equals Tx2 
implies, obviously, that Tx1 minus Tx2 equal to zero, and then use linearity. So T of x1 minus x2 equals to zero. But since the null space is zero, the only element that gets sent to the zero element is the zero element. So x1 minus x2 equal to zero by our assumption. on the null space, nt equal to zero. Therefore, x1 equal to x2, and that's what I wanted to show, to show that t is one to one. So that's the, the business. Um, what's an example? Let's give an example of a linear operator and just sort of go through some of these ideas. Uh, this is what I've done on page three of the notes, too. I um, considered the uh, following mapping. Consider Uh, operator from C01 just as a vector space. No one consider the norm here yet. Uh, to R. So this is the, the vector. The target space is simply the real line. <coughs> Defined by uh, Tx equals the integral from 0 to 1 of the function. Okay. Okay. So what would be, uh, I claim in this case the null space is big. Okay, what's the null space? Um, it would just be all uh, functions whose integral is zero, right? So that's that's big. You can given any function in the space, you can subtract a constant and construct uh, an element of the null space that way. Okay, so null space equal all x in C01 with integral of 0 to 1, x of tau d tau equal to 0. Okay, so that's just the ones that have integral of 0. So that's pretty big. Um, okay. Now I want to try something different. I'm going to try... Um, so here the null space is big. Okay. Why? Well, because there's not much, because there's not much room. Okay. Uh, what we're going to have is we have a rank theorem. Okay. Remember, what's the rank theorem from linear algebra? The rank plus the nullity is the dimension of the, of the domain. Okay? So I'm going to have the dimension of the range of T. Okay, the range of T is actually going to be a vector space. That's not going to be very difficult to see either. Um, if I take two elements of the range, add them, they came uh, from two elements of the domain, okay? And therefore, it's T of a sum. Okay, and therefore it is again in the range. So the sum is if I take y if if y one equals t of x one, y two equals t of x two, then y one plus y two equals t of x one plus x two implies that if I have two elements of the range, then the sum is also in the range. 
Okay? And clearly scalar multiples will also work. So the range itself is a vector space in Y. Right? R of T is a vector space, vector subspace of Y. We're assuming that Y was already a vector space, right? So I can talk about adding things. It's only a question of whether the sum is, again, in the range, right? I can always add Y1 and Y2. Y1 plus Y2, though, is, again, a range element, right? It's, it's the image of something in the domain, X1 plus X2, because, because our domain was a vector space, okay? I mean, I could add, all right? I can always add things in the domain. Okay. So the dimension of the range plus the dimension of the nullity is equal to the dimension of the domain. And even though he doesn't state that rank theorem, that's going to be true here. Um, so um, the dimension of the domain in this case is infinite. Okay. The dimension of the range is obviously going to be 1. You're going to get the full real line here. The only possible vector subspaces of the line are the zero space. That would mean all the functions have to have integral 0. That's not right. right? <laughs> or the whole space. Well, the only thing you might be quibbling about here is this really a linear function? Is this really a linear operator? Is it linear? Yeah. Yeah, it's linear. Yeah. So if you add two functions, you would that means I'm going to do x1 plus x2 before here. This, the sum of two functions means x1 of tau plus x2 of tau. The integral of the sum is the sum of integrals and so on. The, lin the integral itself is linear. So that's obviously linear. Okay, so the range is going to be the whole of R. So that's going to be 1 here. Dimension of the, and the dimension of the domain is going to be infinite, so that means the dimension of the nullity is infinite in this case. So that's how the rank theorem spells out in this case. Where all I'm doing is I'm assuming, I'm not using cardinalities here. I'm not assuming this is, uh, I don't even know if it's true with cardinalities. Okay, but it's certainly true with finite numbers and with the infinity symbol. Okay, that much is true. Okay. I'm not going to get into that cardinality business today, that's for sure. Uh, what's another example? Fix, uh, fix A in C01, and then let's do something a little bit more uh, interesting, perhaps. Um, define T from C01. So C01 is going to be the domain. And then I'm going to map back into C01 um, by Tx equals A, Tx at T, if I want to define, that's going to be a function. So it's going to be A of T times X of T. 0 less or equal to T less or equal to 1. So we define the range element is a function, and we define it uh, by saying its, it's value at T is just A of T times X of T. So I multiply the function x of t by a function a of t. And I think the one they said that was interesting in, in quantum um, mechanics or something was t times x of t. Um, what's the null space here? Well, if a of t has only finitely many roots, Let's consider that possibility. A is a continuous function. Suppose A has only finitely many roots. Okay. How can I get the image function to be identically zero? Well, I'm going to have to have X of T zero everywhere else where A is not zero, right? If A has only finitely many zeros, like a polynomial or something, It only has finally many roots <laughs> by the fundamental theorem of algebra. All right. If A of T has only finally many zeros on the interval, then um, A of T times X of T identically zero implies that X of T would have to be identically zero. Why is that? Well, because x is a continuous function. It would have to be 0 on these long intervals, okay, and so by taking limits. Um, 
you know, x of t identically zero. So you have the null space here is only the zero function. Um, okay. So therefore, um, in this case, then of course t would be invertible. So what's the inverse in this case? So uh, let's say example. Let's just make it explicit. So let's say a of t is equal to t. A of t is equal to t, right? Zero less equal to t less equal to one. Certainly, that only has finitely many zeros. It has one zero at t equal to zero, right? Then um, t x of t equals t times x of t, zero less equal to t less equal to one, is invertible is invertible on c zero uh, invertible, okay. Uh, and so what would it be t inverse of y Okay, would be equal to what? T inverse of y would be e at t would simply be equal to y of t divided by t. Zero less or equal to t less or equal to one. Okay. Uh, now that always makes sense. You might say, well, that doesn't look like a continuous function, All right? Because it's supposed to be back to c zero one. This would be t inverse mapping the range of t back to c zero one. Because this would be the range, okay, I'm saying it's invertible from the range back to C01, okay. That doesn't look like a continuous function, right? If I take, if this is a subset, but y of t is already of the form t times x of t. y of t, if it's in the range, already has a factor of t. All right, so this is the formula for it, but there's no, you're just sending y back to the x from which y came, right? Yeah, it's going to cancel out because y is already y already is t, uh, x t equals t times some x of t. Right, okay. okay, so then it's just going to cancel. Yeah, so it's kind of just a little bit deceptive. Okay, just so you understand the notation. This is mostly notational. There's nothing deep going on there. Except, well, it's not really that theorem. It's not that deep, but okay, two six ten dash a. Okay, all right. Now, what else is true is that when t inverse exists, it's automatically a linear operator. t inverse is automatically a linear operator. t inverse, when it exists, is automatically a linear operator. Okay, is that kind of obvious? Um, So I need to show that t inverse of y1 plus y2, okay, well, y1 plus y2 is t inverse, y1 is already a t of an x1, and y2 is already a t of an x2, right? So now I use the linearity of t. And that's t of an x1 plus x2. Okay, so now here is an image of x1 plus x2, and I want to go backwards. That means I cancel the t's. So this is x1 plus x2, which is t inverse of y1 plus t inverse of y2. So it's fairly immediate just by following the definitions of things that t inverse is also linear. Okay, well, I didn't, I, I'm skipping all the scalar multiplication rules because they're even easier. Okay? Uh, I guess we could check it here, though. Maybe I should check it in this one example. So the question is, is T inverse, uh, so I want to know whether, uh, so this one, I need to check that T inverse of alpha Y 
is equal to alpha T inverse, right? Alpha Y, this is T inverse of alpha T X. The alpha goes inside, so that's T inverse of T alpha, alpha X, which is alpha X, which is alpha T inverse Y. All right, so there, there, it's done. Assuming the inverse exists. So the T inverse makes sense. Okay? All right. What's a, I need to get a little bit further today. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead. What's a, now I'm going to go on to um, normed vector spaces. What's a bounded linear operator? Okay. So that's the basic thing next I want to talk about. So now you know what a linear operator is, okay? And then you'll have to work out a couple examples. That's all there is there. What's a bounded linear operator? So let x and y be normed vector spaces. Okay, and let T be a mapping from the domain from a domain of T, which is inside X, to Y, where DT is a normed vector subspace. It's a subspace, and therefore it's a normed space in its own right with the norm of X, uh, as before, normed subspace, normed vector subspace. Okay. T is said to be bounded linear operator. This is let T be a bounded be a linear operator. There are such things as nonlinear operators, but we're only going to be working with linear operators for this week and next week, okay? For most of the course, I think. Okay. Always linear. So that's a very strong property, but that's what we're going to work with, okay? Be a linear operator. Then uh, T is said to be bounded. If there exists a, uh, a non-negative quantity c greater than equal to zero, a non-negative real number, so that the norm of t x, which I can, that's in the vector space, the norm space y, I can always calculate this in the norm space y. So I could put sub y if you want to add extra tackle here. The norm in the in the norm space y less or equal to c times the norm of x, which is obviously in the norm space x. Okay, the author does not do that. He says there's no need for that. It's just too much notation, so he erases those things. He says there's never going to be any confusion what norm I'm talking about. This is the norm in the, okay, over there. Okay, so that's it for every x in the domain. Now there's an exercise 2.7.2 basically showing that where the name bounded comes from. T is bounded by this definition if and only if T sends bounded sets in X into bounded sets in Y. Exercise 2.7.2. T is bounded linear op uh, T is bounded linear operator. I'm gonna and then I'm gonna just specialize to the case where it's mapping all of X to Y. If and only if T sends bounded 
sets in X to bounded sets in Y. Well, it's obviously, one direction is obvious. If it's a bounded linear operator, and so it satisfies this condition with this constant here, then it'll send a bounded set in X into a bounded set in Y because the bound would simply be the bound for X times C. All right? So that one direction is obvious. What's the converse direction? Okay, suppose now for any bounded set M and X, we have that TM is bounded in Y. Let's just do the converse. Okay? This is the only hard part. You can read the notes here if you want more details, okay? Because I wrote this out. In notes three. So let's uh, do the converse. Suppose M, suppose that for every M bounded set, you know, I'm going to get my hands dirty, bounded set M in X. We have that TM, that would be the image of M under T, equals the set of all Y equals TX. X in M is bounded in Y. So that's our assumption. Now I must show that this condition that TX less equal to C norm X holds. I have to show that this, this, this C exists. All right? Well, let's take this case. Let M, so in particular, let M equal the closed unit ball. So the center is 0 and the radius is 1, and it's closed. I'm talking about the vectors whose norm is at most 1. Closed unit ball in X. Okay. Then by assumption, TM is bounded. So there exists a C sub, uh, sub zero greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero, so that, of course, for every set M, there's a different constant C, but here I'm just doing it for the closed unit ball, C zero greater than equal to zero, so that um, um, Y is less than or equal to C zero for every Y in uh, T uh, B01. I might as well put B01 here instead of TM. Okay? T of B01. Okay? Or I will put parentheses because otherwise it's gets too complicated <laughs> looking. All right? So what does that mean? So now if I take... Uh, so what is that? I need to get this now. Well, T is linear. Okay. Now let X be in X, be anything. Okay. I'm assuming the domain of this operator is all of X. All right. Uh, then X over the norm, and suppose X is unequal to zero. Otherwise, it's trivial. Okay. Suppose the X over the norm of X is therefore in the unit ball, closed unit ball, it's on the, has length one. So, um, T of X over the norm of X is less than or equal to C zero, all right, in norm. But what do we have? We have the scaling. I can pull the scale, this factor norm of X out but the norm of T of X over the norm of X 
is simply equal to uh, by the linearity of t, first it's the norm of 1 over the norm of x times t of x, and then by scaling of the norm, that's equal to t of norm, the norm tx over the norm x. Okay. And so that's also equal to c0 implies this. Okay. <laughs> I'm running out of time. Okay. Okay, with c equal to c0. All right, so I just needed the one constant. All right, so it's just by scaling. Okay, so that's the definition. Okay, now how can you actually compute it? Here's the de here's how you, by the same scaling idea. Here's the formula for the computation. Therefore, so the what we define is the least c. So the, the least c, the least c that can appear in, what do I call this? I'll call this star. Okay. Exists, okay, as a least upper bound. Okay. So, as a least upper bound. Namely, we're going to define the norm of t to be equal to the supremum x unequal to the zero vector of t of x norm divided by x. Okay. And that would be the least c that would work. Okay. Okay, you take you take t of x the norm and divide by the norm of x, and then that's going to be less than or equal to c. All right. So now to get the least c, I'll just take the supremum of all those possibilities. That's certainly less than or equal to c. All right. And so this least there is a least c. Okay. And that's defined to be this, which is equal to the supremum by scaling uh, over the set of all vectors which have norm one of just the t of x. Okay. So there's a simple formula for it. Uh, I guess he's also got x in dt, just to make it. Because we're assuming we're back to uh, the domain is d. Okay. And that's the formula. So um, I have an exercise 2710 that I wanted to go through. It looks like I'm not going to have enough time here um, to do it. But... Um, to do the exercises for next week, you're going to want to know how to do some of the computations I do um, on pages one and two of these notes. Um, actually, is that all I go through here? Yeah, this on those three pages. Okay. It's not too complicated, but mainly, mainly I'm going to um, do uh, examples. So look, read over. And I'll try to finish this, these notes this week so that um, it's not that hard. These four sections, 2, 6 through 2, 9, are not difficult, except for the computations, the problems. How do you actually compute these norms in some cases? All right? And there's something called a uh, bounded linear functional, which is instead of, taking, uh, instead of taking y to be general here, I just take it to be uh, the real line of the complex. I just take it the field of scalars. So if this is if x is a vector space on R, then I take y to be the real line. That gives me a linear functional. Or if x is a vector space of the complex numbers, I take y to be equal to the complex numbers. Those are called bounded linear functionals. You, you define the norm in exactly the same way. It's exactly a special case of the bounded linear operator. And so then we're going to want to be able to compute these norms. All right, is for to get a handle on it, to get some examples. So um, I think that's what I, um, yeah, I do. First, I'm going to take um, exercise 2710. So have a look at that one. That's kind of an interesting one. Maybe look at it and study my notes a little bit about that. 
and because uh, I, I read out the solution here. And we'll start there next time. Okay. The main, the main result is that the bonded linear operator is bounded if and only if it's a continuous. It's continuous, so continuous if and only if bounded. That's the main theorem of the section 2.7, okay, which isn't difficult at all to prove. We just want to recall the definition of continuity for these things. Thank you.